grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this evening from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, it's in his name that we welcome you to uh, evening worship. We're glad that you are uh, here with us uh, as we worship our God in spirit and in truth. Uh, we're here uh, tonight, of course, to praise our God, to give him thanks for the good gifts that he has done, and to finish our uh, sermon series through the book of Galatians well, we hope, Lord willing, um, as we come to the conclusion of our uh, letter of Galatians, uh, Paul gives us a great kind of summary of what he has taught us uh, by showing us the Judaizer, the legalist, showing us Christ, and then pointing to himself as a good example of uh, humility and, and a God-honoring life. And so we're excited uh, to hear uh, God's word read and preached uh, as well. Before we uh, enter into worship, or prepare our hearts for worship, rather, uh, there are a few announcements that we did not highlight this morning that I would like to highlight uh, this evening. In just a few weeks, on February the 12th, uh, during our evening worship service, we'll have our longtime friends Mark and Aileen Mayu. Uh, they'll be visiting uh, during our evening worship service, giving us an update on their ministry, and also uh, Mark will be preaching for us during our service, and so we hope that you'll be with us. Uh, to see our longtime friends. Uh, also on February the 12th, that is Super Bowl Sunday. The mission committee uh, met just this afternoon to help uh, plan Super Bowl Sunday. And so please uh, be paying attention to uh, your bulletin for more information. But of course, like each and every year, uh, after that morning worship service, the youth will be at the doors taking up a special offering to go towards our table of plenty in the fall. And then also we'll be taking uh, soup to widows, shut-ins, and other families in the afternoon. And so, uh, again, please uh, look out for some more details, uh, but go ahead and mark that on your calendars, and we greatly appreciate it. If you haven't picked up your contribution reports uh, or your tithing envelopes, uh, they are at uh, the front doors of the sanctuary. Your name's on them. If you don't see your name and should see your name, please let us know in the church office uh, or if you do, do not usually have tithing envelopes and you would like um, a box of tithing envelopes, there's some blank ones on the bottom shelf of the table. Grab those and Silvio will update uh, your number uh, when you turn in your first envelope uh, with your uh, offerings. And we would greatly appreciate that as well. The flowers this Lord's Day uh, were given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Mrs. Peggy Bryant. The flowers were given by... Brandy and Lee uh, Herndon. That concludes our announcements for now. Let us prepare our hearts for the worship of the living God. One hundred six, Psalm one hundred six. If you could please stand for the call to worship. Here now, as God calls us into His presence, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, you are praised. Uh, you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are the creator. We are the creation. We are dependent on you, and you are dependent on nothing. Uh, Lord, may we worship you tonight. May our worship be pleasing in your sight. Would you enable us to worship, Lord? 
We need your grace, and we ask for it. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, if you'd uh, just keep your uh, bulletin open, if you'd remain standing, uh, we're going to be singing the first uh, hymn, which is in our hymnal, number one. Uh, if you'd turn to number one and let us sing together, all people that on earth do dwell. You may be seated. Well, let us come to this time of a corporate confession of sin. Uh, but before our corporate confession of sin, let's take a, a moment privately on our own uh, where you are just to uh, go to the Lord and privately confess your own sins to God. And then we will come together in a minute and use this uh, printed confession of sin together. So let's go to the Lord. And now let us use this uh, prayer, which is printed in our bulletin, the corporate confession of sin. Let's pray. O King and Father, your Son died and was raised up in power. Now enable us to die to our sin in repentance so that we may rise to new life in him. We confess to you, Lord Though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. Though you should rule us, we control ourselves. Though you should fulfill us, we console ourselves. We think your truth too high, your will too hard, your power too remote, your love too free, but they are not. And without them, we are of all people most miserable. Now heal our confused minds with your word. Heal our divided wills with your law. Heal our troubled consciences with your love. Heal our anxious hearts with your presence. All for the sake of your son who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. We well, hear now the scriptural assurance of pardon from God's word. 
uh, in Psalm 103, looking back to when God revealed to Moses uh, his name as he passed by Moses, uh, the nature of our Lord. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 12, read, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Well, praise God for his gracious mercy toward us. Well, let us uh, take one more time now before we come to uh, prayer and God's word. Um, let's turn in our, bu- in our bulletins to pages, I believe it's eight and nine. We're going to sing a psalm. Um, And you'll notice on these pages, it's both page 8 and 9, that it's printed a little differently, I think, because it'd be too big otherwise to fit on one page. But the first four uh, stanzas, verses, are on the page 8, and then we'll flip over to page 9 and uh, sing 5 through 8. So um, please stand as you're able, and let us sing this psalm uh, together.
may be seated. And as you are uh, sitting, we'll uh, return to our God in prayer uh, together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are holy, holy, holy. And therefore, as we just sung together, what shall we render now unto thee uh, for all of the benefits that you have bestowed on us as your people are plentiful and bountiful, full of blessing and full of favor. And we are those who we have already confessed that we are so unworthy and yet our praise and our adoration and our thanksgiving, our heart uh, is all that we have to offer. And so we pray that we, would, uh, that we would offer it up aright and that you would find it pleasing in your sight. Even as we worship, even as we gather together each and every Lord's Day, would you find our worship pleasing and would you be high and lifted up as we join the angelic courses above in our worship and our praise and our adoration. May we understand rightly that we are here to worship you and you alone. Worship you as you have prescribed in your word so that, so that we might worship correctly and so that our worship might glorify you in all things. And we know, O oh Lord, that the promises are sure that even as we worship together here on your day, you have promised to be here in our midst where two or three are gathered, there you are. And so we thank you. We thank you for the presence that you have bestowed upon us so that we might say with full confidence that we have been in the presence of the Almighty God and we have been touched by his hand and we have heard his word and we now leave more like Christ than even, than even when we came. Surely that is the work of the gospel and we thank you for it that as your word goes out it does not return to us empty. And so, Father, we pray that you would sanctify the saints even this night as we turn our attention to the end of Galatians, that even as we look to you, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus, we pray that we would uh, see you clearly and remember the gospel and that that gospel message would continue to conform our hearts more like thee. We pray, O oh Lord, for the sanctification of the saints here at First Presbyterian Church, even those who aren't with us, may a sign of their sanctification be their presence uh, and their love for Lord's Day worship both morning and evening. Would the sign of their sanctification be true spiritual growth that we might reap the benefits and see the fruit of your Holy Spirit going out and changing hearts. Father, we do pray for the church here and her ministries and we pray that through uh, the sanctified saints, that you would bring our ministries much gospel success, that you would save sinners, that you would sanctify believers, that as we fellowship and as we uh, disciple, as we sharpen one another, we pray that you would uh, indeed give it success, that you would allow it to flourish here. Would you grow us both numerically and spiritually, we pray. We pray that you would uh, raise up more covenant children here within our midst. We give you thanks for those uh, ladies in our church that are expecting babies, and we pray that you would continue to knit these young ones together in the womb so that they might have uh, safe deliveries. Father, even as we see our number growing here at First Pres, we pray that we would take our vows as a congregation seriously and that we would step into these families and that we would assist in raising these children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord so that we might see even more children and even more generations serving you faithfully, full of fear and full of awe for the Almighty God. We pray for those in our congregation who are sick. We know that there are many dealing with different ailments and different daily pains. We know that there are many recovering from surgeries and and mourning the loss of loved ones. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would be a comfort to them by your Spirit. That as we see our brothers and sisters in Christ dealing with these things, that we would lift them up uh, in prayer. But that also our prayers would turn to action and that we would love one another well. And serve one another well. We pray, Lord, for those who are searching for medical answers and having many different tests run, we pray that you would answer uh, all of those questions and that you would give their doctors much wisdom. 
Specifically, Father, we thank you for Miss Pat being home this past weekend and her kidney transplant surgery being such a success already. We give you praise for your provision for her, and yet we pray for the many days, weeks, and months ahead that as her body continues to heal, that it will heal well. We pray uh, for the civil authorities here in our city, from our mayor to our city council. We pray for our county. We pray for our state. We pray for our nation. Lord, from the, the magistrates here in Dillon to the president of the United States, we pray that you would fill uh, all of these uh, houses and senates and council chambers. We pray that you would fill them all with Christian men and women who seek to glorify your name. That there would be the, the foremost goal within their lives and within their terms. That their platforms would be uh, solely to glorify Christ and work for the good of your people. We pray, Lord, for the Christian mission worldwide, even as we think about our, our missions committee meeting this afternoon and we think about uh, Missions Week and Super Bowl Sunday that will all happen this spring. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to grow your church here and abroad. The same prayers that we pray for the sanctification of the saints and the success of ministry and the growth of your kingdom here, we pray for those missionaries that we support around the world. Ethiopia, Honduras, Japan. Father, we pray that you would grow your kingdom if it be in Europe and Africa and Asia, in, in the continent of Americas, south and north, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to do a good work amongst them and give these missionaries and these ministries uh, much, much perseverance in their labors. Father, we come asking now for illumination. We know that we can only hear you rightly if you uh, impart to us your Holy Spirit. And so would you give your Spirit to us afresh, uh, so that we might rightly understand your word as we finish this book of Galatians. And would uh, you, O oh Lord, speak loudly uh, and allow your servants, us, to hear. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, if you will, take your Bibles out to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 18. Verses 11 through 18. Uh, and many times while Paul is writing these letters... Uh, he uses something of a secretary uh, to write for him. And so he would sit there and he would speak what he uh, would desire to write. And those scribes, those secretaries would begin to, to pin down what is to be said. And yet, at the very end of the letter, these salutations and benedictions, Paul would take the letter himself and add something of a personal touch to it. And he would always end with this proclamation of blessing uh, to be had or to be experienced by uh, his original audience. In the uh, letters of First and Second Thessalonians, he ends with a salutation, a benediction, something like this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now that will be similar to how he ends this letter. Uh, talking about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't it fitting that he would end in that way? Because Paul is so concerned with this idea, this message, that the Galatian believers had to add something to their faith to receive favor with God. And so he takes this letter from the hands of his secretary, and he says in verse 11, See what large letters I am writing to you, with my own hand. It's much like if you're typing these days and cut on that all caps button, it is as you're screaming at your audience, saying, do not miss this. I have something to say. And that's how Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, desires to end. He gives some final warnings and then a proclamation of blessing here in this last portion of this letter to the churches in the region of Galatia. And so now with our hearts open, let us hear the word of God as it says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh, who would force you to be circumcised, 
and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for it. As Paul begins to land the plane, if you will, with his letter to the church at Galatia, he begins to ensure or to make sure that his audience has a proper understanding of the gospel. And so he begins to review, if you will, some of the very themes that he has already addressed in this letter as he begins to compare the Judaizer or the legalist with that of a true Christian. But Paul does something very interesting, at least to me here in these final verses, because constantly he has put himself in comparison to these Judaizers, to these legalists, and he does that within these concluding verses, but right in the middle he begins to point you to Jesus Christ there in the middle of our text, specifically in verse 12, and then again in verse 14. He begins to put the cross before us so that we might see that the cross isn't foolishness or a stumbling block as the Jews and the Gentiles proclaim, but that it is the very power of God to save the souls of all who will believe. And so as Paul begins to compare himself with the legalist, he does so by pointing you secondly or in the middle to the only mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, let us look at first the legalist in verse 12 and 13. In verses 12 and 13, Paul begins to say or describe the legalist or the Judaizer, and he does so in four ways, and none of them are very kind. He actually speaks hard truths about the Judaizers, about these legalists, and he calls them first braggarts. He says they brag about their ministry. They brag about the show of ministry. They are all for the glory of themselves. Now you think about the message that they have been preaching. To earn favor with God, you must have faith, yes, but you also must be circumcised. There has to be some sort of work that goes along, some sort of obedience that goes along with your faith so that you might earn your salvation. And yet, as, he, as, as Paul writes, he says, it's those legalists who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. And then again, in 13b, that last portion of verse 13, he says, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Now, what is Paul saying? They might claim that they want you to have a right favor with God. But in fact, they desire for you to be circumcised so that they can boast in your work. You see, here it is that that many false teachers, and I think that I'm okay saying that, many false teachers of the evangelical world want you to come to Christ, quote unquote, because they can add another tally to their uh, website. And you think, well, Matt, that's kind of hard. I actually have heard it myself. Maggie even might remember this. Maybe she had her uh, earmuffs on, her spiritual earmuffs on. But I remember taking the youth group to uh, a traveling concert. Uh, Many different Christian artists were there. And in the middle of this Christian uh, concert, if you will, there would be someone who would come out and he would begin to preach the gospel. And actually, usually it was a very good presentation of the gospel. And, and, and years, for, for three, four years, I would take the youth group to this, and then we stopped going on the fourth year because of this one incident. This guy comes out, and he, he gives a gospel invitation, and of course, you know, it's 
youth group, so it's every head bowed and every eye closed. And, and, and he begins to ask people, you know, raise your hand if you have made a decision to follow Christ this night. And of course, out of the thousands and thousands of people in the room, hands began popping up everywhere. And he goes, and here was the kicker. He goes, make sure you text my phone number on the big screen so that I can add you to my website so that I can show everybody how many people I led to Christ tonight. And my eyes got about this big, uh, and I checked out completely. Now, it's one thing to want teenagers to come to Christ, right? It's one thing to want to preach the gospel so that you might see the salvation of lost souls, but the moment that it becomes... Would you follow Jesus so that I can have one more number to my number? So that I can add one more tally to my count? Showing everybody in the world that I have led these people to Jesus. It becomes, it becomes a bragging, a self-glory. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. He's saying that they do not desire to see the name of the Lord increase. They desire to see their own name increase. You know, oftentimes when I think about braggarts in the Scriptures, and this is not the first time that we see them, but when I think about braggarts in the Scriptures, I think about how, how countercultural it was when, when the disciples of John the Baptist there in the beginning of the Gospels come up to him and they say, Well, John, listen, all of these people are beginning to flock to Jesus and they're being baptized by Jesus' disciples and and we're, you know, we're sitting around twiddling our thumbs. Well, you know, we were, you know, we were kind of the hot name in the evangelical world. And now everybody's left you and gone to Jesus. And it's almost as if he goes, praise the Lord. I must decrease and he must increase. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul's saying is that these false teachers, these Judaizers, these legalists, they preach a message of salvation and the message of salvation's wrong. But they even do so with, with bragging, self-glory hearts. They want to see themselves increasing, not the glory of Christ. But you also see at the end of verse 12 that he says that they are compromisers. They're compromisers. And only in order, he says, that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Christ. You see, what, what we've experienced in the life of Paul when we studied Galatians uh, a number of years ago, maybe even last year, as we've looked at this letter of uh, the Galatians, we, we know that Paul has been severely persecuted because he has traveled around the known world planting churches and preaching the true gospel of Jesus. And, and he has experienced, he even gives us uh, some credence here to it, uh, as he says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. He, he's talking about how he has been beaten, how, how he has been persecuted, how he has suffered. And he says these false teachers, these legalists, they preach a message of faith plus Judaism, faith plus works, so that they will not have to face the persecution. They compromise the message of salvation because they don't want to suffer. And beloved, let me help you understand something. It's exactly what Jesus said, isn't it, in the upper room? Because they hate me, they will hate you. Because I will suffer, you will suffer. Why would you expect anything less than to suffer for the sake of Christ? Because our Christ had to suffer even on this side of glory. It's it's foolishness, isn't it, to be like these legalists here in the text that they water down the gospel message so that they cannot face persecution. And, and sadly, the evangelical church is, is, is dealing with these problems even now. We have what we call contextualization. And I'm not talking about the contextualization as, as understood as if we're in France, we should preach the gospel in French. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this idea that we must be affirming to the LGBTQ plus agenda, that we must be affirming to uh, individualistic rights in our culture. 
That we must affirm any and everything, every ebb and flow of cultural winds that blow against us so that we can be validated, I guess you would say. Affirmed. We must affirm them so that they will affirm the church. Validate the church. See us as with the time, so to speak. And Paul's saying we cannot do such a thing. We cannot compromise the scriptures just because we fear what man might do to us. And that's what he says these legalists do. But also they're persuaders. Look at the first part of verse 12. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. They want to make a good showing in the flesh. So that they'll force you to be circumcised. Maybe your translation says... They want to compel you to be circumcised. These these legalists were were great persuaders. They had a a, a smooth tongue. They had the used car salesman talk, if you will. I remember being young and watching my grandmother, you know, just be led astray constantly by those TV evangelists, you know what I'm talking about. There's snakes in the grass, okay? I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. There's snakes in the grass. Because they had a, a, a good speech. I remember watching one with my grandmother. I won't call him by name. Um, but he, he, you know, he, he's saying, oh, the Lord's telling me there's somebody watching my TV show today that has a headache. I'm thinking, well, that's a pretty good chance. I have a headache from listening to you myself. There's somebody watching my TV show that, that, you know, they don't like their spouse this morning. Well, that's a pretty good chance, too. You know, I mean, it was just the most, most ridiculous claims, and, 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 it's, and it's trying to convince people that they are a messenger from the Lord. And it says, and then, he, you know, he gets real serious. And if that's you, you sow the seed of $250, and I'll make sure that I... Pray for your ailments and your marriage and I'll make sure that you are brought up to the throne of mercy and I'll make sure that you receive this, you know, this thank you note from me personally. Um, and, 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 and I mean, it's just all this smooth talk that leads to a bunch of emptiness. It's the sales talk that, that have convinced these believers in the Galatian churches that legalism was the way for them that they somehow could, could add to their salvation. And so when Paul comes in, and he begins to correct them, saying it's nothing but faith. It's nothing but faith that saves us. He's not doing it with any sort of tricks or schemes. He's just preaching the truth sincerely. And that's what we need to do. We need people who will proclaim the truth of God sincerely and completely. We don't have to be used car salesmen, beloved. We just preach the gospel and let the Holy Spirit work. It's not us that will convince them. It is the Holy Spirit that will convince them. So we do not need to be persuaders. We just show them the beauty of Christ and let the Lord Jesus do the work in their hearts. But also they're hypocrites. Verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Paul says, you know, it's these false teachers, it's these legalists, they say that this is the law of God, that you must be circumcised to add to your faith to get to the ultimate goal of salvation, and yet they have put themselves under the law, a law that they cannot keep. And so they are hypocrites for telling you that you must keep it. I remember hearing a story of Dr. J. Vernon McGee in a, in a sermon years ago, and it's always made a, a, an impact on my life. And he was speaking with um, a city council member there when he uh, took a pulpit in Nashville, Tennessee. He was new on uh, the scene. He was right in the middle of uh, moving, and the city council asked him to come pray for uh, their meeting. And he walks up to this uh, young man who he knows is an elder in this church that he just took a call. But I don't think the elder knew. Clearly the elder didn't know. Because the elder begins to rant and rave about his political opponents. And he begins to gossip and he begins to use foul language. And he just is throwing a racket 
And so Dr. McGee looks at him and he says, well, son, you need to probably know something. I'm your new preacher. And his eyes get, you know, the size of half dollar coins. And, and he says, well, preacher, let me, let me get, you know, I, I, I'm a little hot headed tonight. We've got a busy agenda. And, and believe me, I, I am a Christian. And Dr. McGee said, well, what faith do you follow? And he begins to kind of stumble around his words and he, you know, his heart's breaking because he was supposed to be a spiritual leader within his church. Uh, and his heart's breaking and this guy's falling over, all over his words and he says, well, I follow the teachings of Jesus. And the, and the pastor said, Dr. McGee says, well, well, which teachings of Jesus? And he begins to trip all over his words again. And finally he goes, well, you know what, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a firm adherence to the Sermon on the Mount. Dr. McGee said, well, that's good. Let's run through some questions. And he says, how about hating your brother? He said, those who you will run down with your words and those that you hate within your heart, clearly you hate your political opponents that are going to be here tonight. It is, you know, you might as well murder them because you've already murdered them in your heart. And he goes, well, you know, I'm, I, I must have fallen short tonight, you know, this night. And he goes, well, what about, you know, what about this one that Jesus says that if you even look upon a woman with lust, you might as well have committed adultery against your wife. He goes, well, I, I've, I've failed that one a number of times too. And Dr. McGee looked at him and he said, son, I think it's time for you to pick another faith because you're not keeping this one well. And he begins to talk to him about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the freedom that it brings not to follow or not to have to earn your salvation by following every jot and tittle of the law, but casting your faith upon Christ who will then change your heart so that you might run the race well. You see, what Dr. McGee came in a, a complete confrontation of was a hypocrite. And Paul says that these legalists are hypocrites the moment that they put themselves under the law saying that this is what I follow, this is what I do to earn my salvation, they cannot keep it. Therefore, not only are they headed towards death, but they're hypocrites even within their teaching and their own souls. But to contradict the legalist, I guess you would say, to contrast the legalist, in verses 14 through 16, Paul begins to hold up Christ. Look back at those verses with me. Before be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God or the people of God. Paul, as he, as he contrasts that of the legalist and the heart of the legalist, he begins, to, he begins to hold up Jesus before his audience as he concludes this letter. Because he understands, doesn't he, the person of the cross. He mentions him again here in verse 14. The Lord Jesus Christ is the person who bore the cross for the sins of all who would believe in his name. It's fitting, isn't it, for Paul, even in these closing verses, to mention the Lord Jesus Christ not once, but twice. And actually in the whole letter of Galatians, he references the Lord Jesus Christ 45 times because he wants us to know that our salvation, all the promises of God, find their yes and amen in this one, this man who took upon himself the sins of many see here it is that that paul says that i will boast i will glory only in the cross of our lord jesus christ and and, and you have to you have to understand something what the legalizers what the false teachers boasted in was themselves i follow the law of moses and so if there's any biblical character that they boast in, it will be Moses, but understand what they're saying. It's not even Moses, Moses that they're bragging about. They're saying, it's me. It's me. I have earned my salvation. I have obeyed the law of Moses. I have done what I've needed to do to earn a right standing favor in the eyes 
of my God. It is them that they boast in. And Paul says we cannot boast in anyone but the Lord Jesus Christ. And he even goes on to say that there is nothing, there's absolutely nothing that we can do that will count for anything. But, but a faith in Jesus Christ is what makes us a new creation. It's there in verse 15. Neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. He says it does not matter. Your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ matters, and only then will you be a new creation. And that's the power of the cross. As he points you to Jesus Christ, he points you to the person of the cross, but he also points you to the power of the cross. The power of the cross is he makes wretched sinners clean. That the blood of Christ avails for all who will call upon his name in faith. That even the hardest of hearts will be made soft and new. That our identity is no longer enemies of God, but sons and daughters of God. You see the transforming power of the cross, don't you? In Paul's day, the cross was a symbol of of shame and, and disgrace. You see, the Jews believed correctly that anyone who died upon the cross was cursed by God. That's exactly what Paul is even referenced here in Galatians 3.13. That Old Testament text in Deuteronomy 21, Cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. But his point is the power of the cross is what is a curse to Christ, is the blessing of Christ's people. Jesus had to suffer the very curse of God so that we might earn our favor with God through faith. We cannot boast in our circumcision or our uncircumcision. What Paul's saying is we cannot boast in our obedience, but we must boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ because it's only by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that we have a right standing with God. But he also knew the purpose of the cross as well. The purpose of the cross as well. It was to make us new. The power of the cross is that it can make us new. And the purpose of the cross is it is to make us new. He says, for all of us who walk by this rule, what is the rule that Paul's talking about? It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the rule. He says, if you walk by this rule, peace and mercy is upon them. Understand what what Paul is saying. He's saying, Peace, as in there is no more separation between you and the Father. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no more sin that separates us. We're in complete unity and communion with Him. And it's because of mercy. It's because of grace that has been upon us. You know, that's why I think the, that's why I think the message of Paul is so controversial to to the legalizers, to the Judaizers. Because Paul is saying there is one way to satisfy the wrath of God. There's one way to be in communion with Him, and it is through the Lord Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says in John chapter 14. And so Paul upholds before us very clearly Jesus. You see, if Paul would have said something along the lines of, you know, Judaism is good, obedience is good, but Christianity is better. Paul would not have had nearly the sufferings and the persecutions in which he faced because they would just see that as something like a competition. But Paul says that Judaism, obedience to the law is nothing when it comes to earning our salvation. It counts for nothing, he says. Only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives himself as an example of one who has followed Christ. In verses 17 and 18, really just in verse 17, because the benediction is there in verse 18. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. It's real interesting the way that Paul writes this verse because he's using some language. He's using an illustration that everybody in this region would understand. See, when a servant became part of a household, part of a family in Paul's culture, 
when a slave was brought in to a new, a new village or a new home, they would be branded. They would have on their body, they would bear on their body the mark of that, of that family. And they, it, it, would, it would exclaim to the world that this one belongs to him. That's exactly what, what Paul is saying here. I bear on my body the marks of belonging to the family of God. I'm co-heirs with Christ. Jesus is my elder brother and God is my father. And you can tell because you can look at me. And what does he mean when you can look at me? Well, we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23-28, through 28, what looking at these marks really mean. Here's what Paul says. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and I have told and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold, and I have been naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all these churches. What Paul is saying very clearly here is, if you will look at me, you will see my body is broken, and my body is tired for the sake of Christ. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying we cannot look towards any any false teacher that lives in the ivory tower. We must actually beware of the religious leaders who live in ivory towers and know nothing of the suffering for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One commentator said, a modern day commentator said, Paul was no armchair general. He was out on the front lines raging war against sin and taking his share of suffering. And that is what we must do as well. We cannot sit back and watch the church move forward, take its lumps, and say, I cannot be a part of that. But we must be those who will fight on for the cause of Christ. We must share in the sufferings of our Lord and Savior Jesus so that we might say, wouldn't it be a blessing to say even, that I bear on my body the marks of my Savior. So Paul comes to the end of his letter and he closes the way that he began. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that really says it all, isn't it? That if we are to have a right relationship with God, we don't add works to our faith. No, we simply possess faith, which is a grace from God, a gift from God, so that no man can boast, but that only we might boast in Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to this, your word. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we would be those who are not caught off guard by false teachers, nor the cultural winds that attempt to blow us to and fro, but that we would press on as true soldiers of Christ, that we would be a part of the church triumphant, that we would even count it a joy to face even the sufferings of our Lord and Savior. Father, that is mind-boggling to us in our natural being, and yet, supernaturally, would you allow us to see the beauty of what Paul says, that he bears the marks of his Jesus. Father, let us know that we're not exempt from suffering, but that as the world hates our Christ, they will also hate us. And yet, let us stand boldly and with a fear of God, that fills our heart to holy courage so that we might be found right and ready on the day you return. We ask these things in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Well, it's good for us to sing in response to uh, God's Word. And so if you'll take your hymn books out and turn with me to 439. 439, we're going to sing that hymn, Christ Shall Have Dominion. Let's stand and sing together. Receive the Lord's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.